Greetings. We are back with another monthly commentary for the month of October this time. So the fourth quarter has gotten off to a better start than the rest of the previous nine months. So in this version, we are going to cover some context for 2022, how this year stacks up versus the last 90 or so inflection points around market bottoms, which October has a historical significance in forming of bottoms. And I think you'll find some interesting data points in empirical evidence around bottoms forming in October. We'll talk about housing and rents. You know, I, I, I'm getting the question, why is inflation so sticky? And look no further than housing and rents, which there are some silver linings there. Well, depending on how you look at it. We'll, we'll look at the consumer. Much of the inflation pressure we've seen in 2022 has been blamed on supply chains and COVID and all these things, uh, which certainly factor in. But we've been saying all along that demand, this has very much been a demand-driven inflationary cycle, meaning people are buying more stuff than ever. So we'll, we'll look at the consumer, look at savings rates, look at consumer debt. Uh, maybe we can uh, gain some insight from some of those uh, changes that we've seen over the last couple months. And then finally, uh, we'll look at the odds of a Fed rate hike and what the yield curve is telling us. So I hope you enjoy this. I apologize. I'm fighting a cold that my kindergartner or preschooler brought home. Uh, it seems to be that time of year. So I sound terrible, but I'm rounding third base and starting to feel better. Let's get into it. So first, some context. What this is, is a glide path for every 25% plus drawdown in the first 200 trading days of a calendar year since 1928. Okay, so what are the ugliest starts to calendar years over the last 90 plus years? And you can see 2022 is in this thick red line, kind of a gradual journey down. There's only been a few years that have been worse, notably 1987, uh, let's see, 1982, I'm reading that correctly. That could that could be 1929 or 1932. I think that's uh, the 30s because this is pretty violent. And then this gray is uh, from 1920. So what this is saying is this is one of the worst starts that we've ever had to a calendar year, which doesn't surprise anybody. What is surprising is how historically bad this year has been. So since 1928, there's been one year that the S&P 500 in the U.S. 10-year Treasury have been down more than 10%, one year in over 90 years, and that is 2022. And you can look at this. So look at this. This is as of 1021. So the S&P down roughly 20%, the 10-year bond down roughly 20%. You can go back and spot check every single year, and there's not been a worse year for both the 10-year and the S&P 500 in the last 90-some-odd years. And as you might guess, for the 60-40 portfolio, 60% 60 stocks and 40% bonds, which, are, which is a very popular asset allocation, that has seen the worst year since 1931. Check that, 1937, but still, the point still stands. This has been a, and I don't like to throw this out, this has been a unprecedented year on the bad side. So again, in an environment like this, we are all going to feel pain. Most everyone is going to feel pain, especially if you're an investor. The focus is mitigating damage. Negative outcomes are part of investing. It's our job and our focus to mitigate damage. And if you haven't seen any of our posts on how to mitigate damage without placing a trade, I would encourage you to check those out. I think they stand the test of time. Uh, they focus on the things we can control versus external factors that we can't control. Okay, one of the most uncomfortable parts about 2022 is most asset classes are moving together, meaning stocks, bonds, pretty much everything under the sun from gold, all move down together, which is very common during times of market stress. But I always like to say, it doesn't do you any good to own 10 different asset classes if they all go down together. So what this is, and I know there's a lot going on here, but I, but I promise I'll uh, try to make this as simple as possible. So what you see here is the S&P 500, other various equity asset classes like mid-cap mid -cap stocks, small-cap stocks. We go into some sectors. We've got real estate, foreign stocks, emerging markets, U.S. bond market, 
longer maturity bonds, oil, gold, and the dollar. And this is the same on the Y axis as it is on the X axis. And basically what we're showing here is how closely assets move in relation to each other. Let's, let's pick a pair. Let's look at small caps over here in the S&P 500, okay? It's green and the correlation is 0.93% or 0.93, okay? That means these assets move almost one-to-one. -one. A correlation of one would be perfect positively correlated asset. So the S&P 500 correlated with the S&P 500 makes sense that it's one. They, they move in lockstep because it's the same thing. Small caps in the S&P 500, and this is just for 2022, are basically almost 100% positively correlated. So when the s and is up 10%, small caps are gonna be up 9.3%. So very closely positively correlated. Yellow means the asset is positively correlated. If it's a positive number and it's yellow, that means they do move together, but just less so. Okay, so let's look at, let's look at energy and the S&P 500, right? Energy right here where my mouse is, the S&P 500, correlation of 0.41. So that means if energy's up 10%, the S&P might be up 4%. So still moving in the same direction, just less so. Let's find one that has a correlation of zero. Okay, so here's a correlation of zero. So this would be long bonds. So if I scroll over here, if you follow my mouse, long maturity bonds and foreign stocks, so all world stocks minus the US, that has a correlation of zero, meaning there is no correlation, it's random. So foreign stocks might be up, bonds might be up, bonds might be down, foreign stocks might be up. There's zero correlation, it's just random. Finally, red means an asset is negatively correlated, meaning let's look at the dollar and the S&P 500. If the dollar is down, the S&P is going to be up. Okay. If the S and P is up, the dollar is going to be down. Okay. Ideally you would want your less risky assets like bonds, right? You know, historically bonds are a safe haven to be negatively correlated to equities, right? So when equity markets go down, historically the, the, the role and the relationship between bonds and equities has been negative. So when stocks go down, bonds go up. That helps mitigate downside risk. And historically bonds act differently during times of equity market stress. As you can see in 2022, that is not the case. Bonds are positively correlated to equities almost across the board. That's not good. And again, that's why this year has been so uncomfortable. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I want you to pay attention to this. A lot of green, a lot of yellow, which are, are bad, you don't want your assets moving together, versus the last five years, so 2017 to 2021. Okay, so we're gonna look at correlations from 2022 over the last five years, okay? So, so look at how this changed, and, and I'm gonna to toggle back and forth uh, because I don't want you to get deep in the weeds, I just, want you, I just want you to see the theme. There's a lot more orange, there's a lot more red, that's what you wanna see, you can see all the bonds Snapshot of the U.S. bond market, long bonds, negatively correlated to equities, right? These bond asset classes are negatively correlated to equities. This is a function of a normal market. Let's go back to 2022, a lot more yellow. That's a function of a stressed market, a disrupted market, a volatile market. So again, last five years, 2022. Red is good, yellow not so good. Okay, let's move on. So I mentioned in the open that October has historically been the month of the bear market low in, in many previous bear markets. Now, I'm not saying that October of 2022 is going to mark the bear market low, but for whatever reason, in bear markets, October has marked the bottom in 2011, in 2002, 1998, 1990, 1987, 1974, 1966, and 1957. So what I grabbed what this is, is uh, the more recent years that I just rattled off, starting with 1982, here's 87, here's 2002, 2009, and 2020. And, and, and this isn't necessarily October lows in these, in these particular years, but um, the thing that I wanted to point out is, look how, 
little of trading days that the market clunks around on the bottom, right? 16 trading days in 1982, total of 12 trading days hovering around the bottom in 1987, five trading days in 2009, 10 trading days in 2002, uh, two trading days in 2020. So people that are always trying to time a bottom, you have a very, very small window usually. And these inflection points, as I've written about, are impossible to time. There, there's no flashing neon sign that says the market is at a bottom. So I would caution those that are sitting on a bunch of cash that have sold everything, waiting for things to clear up, waiting for things to get better. The market doesn't wait for things to get better to snap back. It waits for things to get slightly less bad. So when the data gets slightly less bad, when people feel the worst, maybe even when the news is the worst, that's when markets bottom. And it's a very small window. So I, I wouldn't get caught up in playing the market Oracle and the market gypsy and trying to perfectly time a bottom. It's really a fool's errand. Uh, you know, the time to get more aggressive, the time to get reinvested is when you feel the worst. Okay. So, so when you feel like you want to throw up, that's historically a good time to put cash to work. And again, things can get worse. Uh, things could go down from here. I'm not saying you can set your watch to any of this. I'm not saying that we've hit a bottom, but historically October for whatever reason, has marked the low in many a, of a bear market cycle. And the second po point of this graphic is your, your window, the market bottoms are very, very short. And you can see where we're currently at, clunking around the bottom here in 20 trading days so far in 2022. So if you're looking at this, you might say, okay, this is a long period of time relative to history versus the rest of these bo bottom formations. Maybe we've hit a bottom, maybe it gets worse. I don't know. Earnings season, we are in the throes of earnings season. So yesterday on uh, October 25th, Microsoft and Google posted some not so good earnings. Uh, Google got hurt on ad, on ad revenue. Uh, Microsoft uh, got hurt by a stronger dollar. Uh, but overall, I think the takeaway for earnings season thus far, and you can see the frequency of companies reporting as we move through October and into November, really heavy in the coming weeks. And this is where we're at now, this week here, 25th, 26th, 27th, 28th, you can see a very high number of, of companies are reporting this week. And up until this point, earnings have been pretty decent, minus uh, what I just rattled off. One thing that I'll be writing about uh, is the number of times that you hear inflation in a earnings call. So these companies report earnings, the CFO, the CEO get on the phone and talk about the talk about the quarter, talk about the year, they forecast. Inflation comes up almost eight out of 10 times. What's interesting to me is operating earnings, operating margins are still really high. So companies are worried about inflation, but their operating margins haven't really changed. They're, they're still pretty consistent with where they were pre-inflation, pre-COVID, pre-pandemic, which tells me that companies are increasing prices under this cover of inflation, right? Inflation is everywhere. It's in the media, it's in your social circle, but perhaps some of these companies input costs haven't changed. And there's this narrative going around. There's this uh, theme going around called greedflation where companies are increasing prices despite the fact their input costs have not gone up or gone up maybe marginally but they're increasing prices much, much more than that. And this shows up in a in number of ways, and I don't want to go, go off the grid here, but it's, it, it doesn't make sense. They're talking about inflation. Their operating margins have not changed, meaning they're passing along costs to consumers while maintaining those healthy margins. That's an interesting conundrum. And I think we're, we're going to hear more about this concept of greedflation as, as the months pass. So I get the question all the time, why is inflation so sticky? And look no further than rents and home prices, which tend to be uh, slow to slow to subside. Meaning we've seen a lot of home price increases, a lot of rent increases over the past year. It's really there's there's a lag in the data for that to show up in the CPI numbers. And and when you look at shelter, it's the biggest component or one of the biggest components in the CPI figures. Okay, and rents have been specifically very, very sticky, but they're starting to roll over, but it has not yet shown up in the CPI data. 
So housing is captured and, and a, a lot of people argue and say the way home prices are captured in the CPI is very misleading and very broken. And what, what is in the CPI is owner's equivalent rent, which is an obscure thing. It's basically what a homeowner could rent their house for, okay? And this is just a, a journey of home prices, the Case-Shiller Home Price Index, trying to measure national home prices. And this is the second straight decline after 126 consecutive months of increases, okay? And for context, we just threw in 2007 and 2008. You can see there was a massive decline. Uh, you know, we're not there yet. I'm not predicting this, although uh, I certainly would expect this line to, to drop a little further. But this eventually will make its way into CPI. Okay. Looking at rents. So let's look at rents. This is the U.S. monthly rent national average year over year change. Uh, this is via apartment list through the end of September. And you can see rents have really fallen off a cliff. And the year over year price increase went from 18% in January of 2022, going back to January of 2021, to a much smaller increase from September 2022 back to September 2021. So again, this eventually will make its way into the CPI data, but it has not yet. So again, rents, owner's equivalent rent, home prices, all huge components of the CPI number, which is lumped together as shelter. There's a quite, quite, quite a lag in this data. This will eventually make its way through CPI and show CPI eventually ebbing down, which we've said would, would be a huge win for the Fed and a huge win for financial markets. A natural ebbing of inflation would make the Fed's job a lot easier. They could potentially take their foot off the brake and, excuse me, the foot off the, well, yeah, the brake, stop raising rates so aggressively and maybe even pause or, or raise uh, smaller. So instead of 0.75%, maybe they can raise 0.25%. Uh, that would be a, a silver lining and a potential inflection point for the equity markets. Okay, now we're looking at uh, interesting chart that a lot of people are looking at. Sorry, this is blurry, but this is commodities. So a basket of commodities. So think corn, coffee, oil, natural gas, yada, yada, cattle versus the CPI. And historically, this goes back to 1999, these two lines, right, if you follow them, are very closely correlated. So we talked about correlation. This would be a positively correlated data set. And you can see the blue line, commodities, is, is, is more wild, which makes sense. It's, it's, it's all over the place. Um, so when commodities go way down, CPI goes down, but less so. When commodities go way up, CPI goes up, but less so. What we've seen over the last couple months is commodities really falling off a cliff, but CPI is still sticky up here. So it hasn't quite caught up with commodity prices. So again, if you're seeing, if you're seeing commodities drop by a lot, you would expect to see CPI drop, but less so. So maybe somewhere in here, and you can see that CPI year over year numbers would then fall. So we're seeing softening in economic data, softening in economic activity, commodities falling, rents falling, uh, owner's equivalent rent, real estate falling. Eventually, this is going to make its way through and show up in CPI. Now, the market is not going to wait for all this to happen. If you're, if you're looking at bond action and, and, and equity price action over the last couple of weeks, I think it's starting to sniff this out. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to pound the table and say that so, but the market is starting to behave better. Bonds are starting to act differently than equities. Uh, so the market potentially is starting to sniff this out and put the pieces together. And this is a survey from Germany, but uh, this is the lowest U.S. inflation expectation reading ever for this particular survey. And again, this is just one data, one data point, but I find this interesting. And, you know, you can kind of see where we're going. You're, we're piecing all these things together and the, the tea leaves, if you will, are, are sniffing out lower inflation expectations going forward. Okay. So back to my comments, a lot of the inflation that we've seen over the past couple of years has been demand driven in our opinion, meaning consumers like you and I going out and buying stuff. Okay, we were all locked in the house. Uh, the government was dropping money in our bank accounts. 
uh, businesses were getting PPP loans. Uh, and we basically were unleashed on the economy to go out and spend, go out to eat, go to movies, take a vacation. And it was like the pool scene from Caddyshack, right? The caddies got 15 minutes, they unleashed them, they all went in the water and went crazy. That's basically what consumers were doing. But the juice is starting to run out. So you can see the personal savings rate hit a, a huge spike as we got these stimulus checks, right? It was all choppy. We got these spikes. We got these drawdowns. We got these spikes as we kept getting various phases of stimulus checks. All that has run out, right? So this is through the end of July. All that has run out. So the savings rate for the U.S. consumer is at the lowest rate since 2008. Conversely, consumer debt, think credit cards, are at the highest, highest since 2011. So savings rate extremely low. So investor, excuse me, consumers have depleted their savings. They're actually going in the hole and either spending money that they don't have or just putting money on their credit card um, because they want to keep buying stuff, right? So this is like another, maybe a fallout from the pandemic. Like they're, they're not done spending and they're willing to go into uh, debt to continue to buy stuff. So what this is saying is basically the consumer's tapped out. Again, uh, when you're getting inflation, when you're getting all these weird disjointed things coming out of the pandemic, it's, it's dangerous to draw conclusions and say, okay, inflation's high today, consumer spending a lot today, that's going to continue over the next five years. This is signaling an inflection point that the American consumer is potentially tapped out. They're not saving as much and they're going into debt to maintain their lifestyle and, and to continue to buy stuff. This is unsustainable. And if consumers stop buying stuff, then that could mean inflation subsides, inventories build, companies start to discount. So again, you can see how the tea leaves are reading that inflation could potentially subside. That said, the last inflation report we got was unfavorable uh, for a lot of the reasons that I just mentioned. You know, a big component of that, again, was rents and owner's equivalent rent, which was still sticky on the high side. So it's almost a certainty that the Fed is going to hike by 0.75% in the upcoming November meeting. So last month, I said that the Fed could potentially, the market was pricing potentially, the Fed could take their foot off the brake and hike less, hike by 50 basis points or a half of 1% instead of three-fourths of 1%. You can see the percentages uh, were basically... 72% the Fed would hike by 0.75 back in the end of September. Now it's virtually 100%. So it's almost a certainty that the Fed is going to hike by 0.75% come the November reading. Uh, and you can see that you can see that in the numbers here. Uh, so, you know, I, I, again, there's a lot of talking heads proclaiming what the Fed does next. We prefer to take our cues from the market. This is what investors are pricing in, voting with their capital, what they're pricing in for what the Fed does next, which again is virtually 100% certainty of a 0.75% increase in November. Now, the fear is the Fed is increasing rates aggressively into a softening economy. The yield curve is inverted, meaning shorter dated yields are higher than longer, uh, longer dated yields, uh, which is the sign of economic stress. It's been a precursor and the yield curve is inverted to a recession. And we've just hit the point where a recession is, is all but imminent if we're not already in one. So what this looks at is the percentage of data points on the yield curve there that are inverted, okay? When, when this blue line reaches this red line throughout history, that has marked a recession 100% of the time. We just hit that. So the risk is the Fed is increasing rates while the tea leaves, the inflation tea leaves are, are saying inflation is subsiding, the American consumers potentially tapped out, rents are going down, real estate's going down, the Fed has tunnel vision, they're hell-bent on increasing rates. The fear is they're going to push us off into a recession at a time when economic conditions are already naturally softening. That's the biggest risk right now, a policy error. And if you look back at what the Fed has said, they basically said inflation was not a problem in 2021. Now they're saying inflation is a huge problem. We'll do anything it takes to quash it, to stomp it out. There's not a lot of credibility for the Fed right now because they've been wrong. Uh, they've been wrong potentially twice. And 
the biggest risk right now is a policy error, them increasing rates into a softening economic environment. People ask me all the time what I think happens next. I answer that with, if you want someone's opinion on what happens next, look at how they're positioned. And we are positioned very conservatively, okay? We are underweight equities across the board. We are overweight, high quality fixed income, especially short-term US treasuries. So if you've been following my, my writing, there is a reasonable place, a safe place to get a return on cash or cash equivalents. And I think that's low hanging fruit right now. So we've taken a lot of our fixed income portfolios and overweighted short-term US treasuries where you could get 4.5% roughly on a one year US treasury in an environment where there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of disruption, that's a pretty attractive trade. That trade hasn't been available the last 10 plus years. So, you know, I see a lot of advisors, I see a lot of forecasters talking heads on TV, proclaiming what happens next. If I was a consumer of that information or a client of those advisors, I would ask, how are you positioned? How are you managing risk? Because that's how you really feel. That's how you express how you really think what happens next. So I would challenge anyone that is in a social circle working with another advisor, make sure what they're saying reconciles with what they're doing. Okay. So I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, I'm open to feedback on different formats. You know, there's a lot of information. I, I do try to change it up, but I also try to revisit themes that I've talked about in the past. Like I think it's important how I talked about uh, what the market was pricing in for the Fed in September versus what they're pricing now in October for the November meeting. So I'll, I'll continue to revisit important themes and I'll continue to look for data points that people want to hear more about. If you have any feedback, have any questions, if you want to learn more about how Pure Portfolios manages client assets or how we work with clients, feel free to email insight at pureportfolios.com. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.